Pascal, welcome to Badu, and please uh, start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, so uh, as was just said, I've been doing computer vision for uh, for a while, and actually, the kind of thing I've been working on a lot is modeling surfaces and surfaces that deform. So, for example, this is a baseball that's being thrown against a baseball bat, something that looks like one, with great force. And the game is to try to model the deformation. And you might wonder why I do this. I'm in, uh, I come from Europe, where we don't really care very much about baseball. But it turns out that uh, we have a collaboration with people in uh, Washington State. These people are mechanical engineers, and they want to do simulations of these kinds of uh, shocks because they are really they are allegedly the baseball lab of America. And uh, so we obliged them. So we talk, We took this uh, um, with a fast camera. We had an initial model of the ball that's round. We deformed the round ball to project it onto the image. That from this, we can actually infer what the volume is. And, um, and then we do that for all images in sequence and we model the impact. And why is this useful for the people in, uh, in Wazoo? It's because their simulations are good, but not perfect. So they want to refine them so that what they simulate looks like reality. So that's an interesting situation, situation where the vision is providing the ground truth. And another example of that, we've done a lot of work in sports of all kinds. And this is a sailboat that's meant to go around the world with a solo, a single person. And that takes 70 to 80 days and nobody can stay alert. So it's a race, of course, and nobody can stay alert for that long. Uh, so what we have been working on is uh, having a system that tracks the sail and uh, see how it deforms and advises the sailor on how it should be trimmed. And actually an improved version of this would trim the sail automatically. So you'd have a robotic sailboat, basically. So uh, for one thing, I have to point this out. All of this is come, uh, you've just given some dates. So all of this comes from prehistory where algorithms were not deep. It's purely math and geometry, yet it does stuff. Uh, and one thing it did is it got us interested in modeling surfaces and not only in uh, uh, optimizing them, not only in reconstructing them from images, but in actually optimizing them for a purpose. So let me explain, and that's going to be the main topic of the talk. So let me explain that. What you've seen in, this, uh, in these videos is based on explicit surface meshes. We have triangle meshes, and we optimized them and we reasoned in terms of the vertices of the mesh. And this is a very good and very prevalent representation. However, with the emergence of deep nets, it has been realized that you could actually do even better. And that's based on another old idea. And the old idea is that of implicit fields. So one way to represent a surface is to have a field in a volume and to make the surface be the zero crossing of that field. And why is that good? Because it's you can represent details at a very high resolution. You can change your topology. Topology is not fixed. And out of this, you can get regular samplings. So it's a very nice representation. It's been uh, known at least since the 1980s. But until recently, there was a problem with it, which is if you have to represent this, did you see my mouse? 
Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I can see them. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, so uh, the you had to represent this big cube to represent the field, and as soon as you want a lot of resolution, the the, the field the um, the cube becomes huge, and that's too big for the memory of the computer. And that was true of, until about two years ago when some bright guys came up with the idea of the deep implicit fields. So the cube is not represented directly as a cube. It's represented by a deep net that computes the values of the implicit field. And that happens in 2019. And since then, there's been a flurry of papers about this, and uh, this actually is the representation I'm going to, going to talk about. So just to uh, maybe to remind you and to uh, give you the formalism. So formally, what are we doing? We are defining a function f, typically a sine distance function from R cube into R and f so that for any x in R cube, actually there is a typo in my uh, slide, f of x is the sine distance to the surface. So the x's for which f of x is zero are the points on the surface. And one very, very good thing about this representation is it can change its topology at will. And this is much harder to do with uh, explicit surfaces. So that's always been true, but the problem has been that how do you represent f? If you represent it explicitly as a cube, it's too memory intensive. So the solution was to represent f using what's known as a deep SDF, where as input you have, you have x, you have some network that computes f theta of x, and f theta really represents the field. And I'm going to call that s, because typically it's going to be a sine distance function. And you can refine this by introducing uh, a condition or a code so that the network takes as input not only a point in space x, but also a code c. And the value of f of theta now depends on c, which means the shape that you get is parameterized by C. And that really is what the deep SDFs are. So they are great, but they have one problem. And the problem is if you happen to need an explicit surfaces, and I'll present in a moment uh, cases where you do need explicit surfaces, you have to extract the vertices and extract the triangles. And typically you're going to do marching cubes. And the problem with marching cubes, it's not differentiable and it's often slow, which means you cannot put it in a deep net architecture, at least not easily. So this is the problem we've actually addressed in defining a, a deep SDF pipeline that produces meshes and such that it can be integrated into a full architecture because it, <laughs> It's end-to-end -end differentiable. So formally, when you train a network, that's going to produce a mesh defined by its vertices and its facets. You are going to minimize some loss L. That's a function of the vertices and the facets. So when you do the forward pass of something like this, you take your implicit field, capital S, you run the marching cube on it, and then you compute some value at the vertices. When you want, so that's fine, there's no problem. Where it becomes a bit tricky is when you want to do the backward pass to train your network. You are going to want to differentiate the loss with respect to the code C. So if I write this at the usual chain rule, this is the 
derivative of the loss with respect to the position of the vertex time the, deri the derivative of the position of the vertex with respect to the field time the derivative of the field with respect to C. So the, this term, the first term and the third term in there are differentiable, no problem. Where you have a problem is this one. Because you computed VI using a marching cube, it is not a differentiable function of S. And that is a problem. But that problem can be solved. Why? First, let's recall that F theta approximates a sine distance function. So typically it's granite as one of norm one and the normal to that field is the gradient of F, which is differentiable. That means you can in fact prove that if you have a vertex V or a point actually V on the surface, on the ISO surface, if S is an SDF, then when you change S a little bit by some delta S, that point will move in the direction normal to the surface. So in fact, what you can have, we can show, is that DVDS exists and in fact, it's simply the normal to the field, which is the gradient of S. And in fact, that result can be generalized. This is true for any continuous F that you use to define your ISO surface. It's just that if, uh, if it's not an SDF, the formula becomes slightly more complicated because you have to normalize gradient of S by its norm. And of course, these two formulas are compatible because in the case of an SDF, the denominator here is one. So all of this to say that when you try to compute this, this term, actually you do have a derivative. So you can replace this by this expression, which is computable and which reduces to this if F theta is the SDF. In other words, you can create an explicit mesh in a way that's differentiable. Mm. Okay, so all of this to say that we can now go, go from a code C to a triangular mesh in a differentiable way. And we can do this in such a way that uh, the surface topology can change. So here's a very, uh, very simple example where we start with a deep SDF code, for example, one C0 that's going to approximate a sphere. And then we are going to drag it to minimize the loss function that says, I want you to be like a, tor a torus. So what you do at every step is you use marching cube to compute uh, the mesh and the vertices. Uh, you use those vertices to do the forward pass. I've told you that this was straightforward. And then what is less straightforward, you use the same vertices for back propagation. You don't recompute them. You just use them as points on the surface. That lets you compute the derivative of the loss. And then you can back propagate. You deform the the mesh and once you deform it you rerun marching cubes to get new samples on the surface and in that way the non-differentiability of marching cubes does not bother you so here's an example of this at work we start with a with a, a cow actually this is a, this is the uc davis cow that turns into uh, a duck. And it does so in a differentiable way. Um, and at every step, you have a nice mesh on which you can compute a loss function. Being so, you seem a little, it's okay. 
Okay, everyone else, if you want to ask questions, do not hesitate. It's more interesting that way. Uh, okay, so let me show you how you can use this. So one way, one thing we can do with this is... Yes. Uh, actually, I have a question. So, uh, so you must understand it. the function is uh, something like local. How 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 the representation be related to global information such as the genus? Well, okay. So we are using the deep SDF formalism that takes a code C and it takes as input a code which are the parameters of the surface and a point in space. And it computes the value of the implicit function at that point. And of course it does that for all points in space. Uh, yes, so you, but, but I think the property is local. I mean, so- Yes, it's, uh, it's local, but C is global. It's the same C for everyone. Okay, but how to guarantee that it produces some global? Uh, what do you so, mean to? Uh, okay, so this is. Uh, let me maybe let me give a couple of examples. I think it'll be clearer. Uh, when uh, so here is what we do is so this is single view reconstruction. We have a bunch of uh, say images of cars and they are 3D models. So this is ShapeNet. So uh, we have a bunch of images. We train a ResNet to produce what I'm calling C, the code. And then a decoder that will produce F of theta, uh, this function that takes uh, as input the code and a point in space and produces F theta of X given C. Um, and then how do you train that thing? Well, you have, um, for example, you have silhouettes of the car and you can minimize the projection of the car, of the 3D model on the, on the image, the difference between the projection of the, the, the points on the surface and the implicit from and the silhouette. So you train your network so that the projected surfaces project at the right place. So what this gives you is a pipeline like this one, where you start with an image, you get a code C that allows you to define a 3D surface. You run marching cubes, that gives you a mesh, and then you run the differentiable renderer that gives you the projection, S of C. And because of the trick I mentioned, you can actually compute derivatives of this S or C because all these operations are differentiable, which is what I proved earlier. So you can use it in a generative way where you feed an image and it gives you a C that creates a silhouette. And you can also use it in a generative way where you optimize with respect to C so that the projections are as close as possible to this guy. So for example, if you start with a chair, an image of a chair, you'll get a code C by going, going through the ResNet and that code, once you decode it, will give you something that looks kind of the chair, but not very precisely. You can then refine it so that it looks more and more closely like the original chair to get the result on the right. So you get something that 
projects at the right place um, give it from the same point of view, that's normal. That's what you minimize for. But what's interesting about this is if you look at it from a different viewpoint, it still looks right. And you can do this for all sorts of chairs and uh, you get something, uh, uh, something reasonable. With the usual at the time, of course, it was state of the art. Uh, there was a question. Did I? Did somebody ask something? No. Okay. So, one way this can be used is to do editing. So, for example, you can start with a sketch. I know what was it? It's a sound on my own video. Uh, Pascal, there's no sound now. Well, there is no sound. Yeah. It's funny because I, I hear it. So, okay. So I'll do the comment. So um, the so the idea is you sketch something and the it creates a code that gives you a car that matches the contour. Then you can change the contours and it will deform the, the, the cars who match the new contour. So you can edit online this way. So here is uh, an example with a chair. So I draw a new place for the feet and it moves the, the 3D model so it fits the feet. And you will notice that the chair remains symmetric because it has never seen asymmetric chairs so it actually, when it moves one foot, it moves all the others. Now what you can do is also, uh, that's actually an interesting part. We're going to lower one of the arms of the chair. And when we lower it enough, you, uh, at some point, Oh, something magical just happened. The arm of the chair has disappeared. In other words, the genus of the chair has changed. So uh, is it clear what happened? Uh, hi, Prof. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, how, uh, so when you draw a line, it actually uh, changed the code say, right? But how yes, does so it you work? Uh, how so, does the network so, know? Uh, how, so how the, 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 the network doesn't know. It's what knows is it's what I call the generative model. So at this point, uh, the network is frozen. So the theta parameters are frozen. So what happens is you what you change is C. You, optim you change the code so that the outlines of, uh, of the 3D model are what you want them to be. Mm, but how does the network know the shape should just uh, change because, perfectly with the line? Because, you, because you've trained it first. Uh, so uh, how how do I know? Uh, no, it doesn't. Okay, sorry. No, the question is here. You have this, you are minimizing the subjective function. Yes. You have a 3D shape. That's a function of C. Yeah. And then you project it using a differential renderer. So 
this is a function of C that you compare to your outline. So you minimize this. Oh. The distance between the true outline and the projected outline. Okay. And uh, of course, I didn't mention this, but I, uh, if you are interested in the details, uh, all this is published, so I can send you the, I'll send the links to Ping, and you can uh, forward them. Thank you. Okay, so um, what I just showed was, I think the single view reconstruction is a bit of a toy problem. It's really useful to get published in ICCV and CVPR, but there really are better ways to get 3D geometry if you need it. So uh, let me show you a real problem in which uh, this can be used. Uh, and this problem is 3D shape design for performance. So say you want a race car, Baidu becomes very, very successful and you need a race car and you want to uh, uh, design it so that, uh, so that drag is reduced. So the typical way you're going to do this is to design a shape, run a simulation. So we are back to simulation, uh, see how well it works. And then if it's not quite right, you will redesign. And the problem with this approach is that it's very slow because a very accurate simulation takes a long time. And so the loop between designing, optimizing, checking, redesigning is slow. So you really want to automate this. And one, the way this is done in industry is by using a technique that's known as Krigging which we know as Gaussian processes. And the way it goes is, uh, as on this slide, you take a number of examples, um, which, uh, on which you run simulations. So for example, this, this is meant to represent an aerodynamic simulation with a CFD. So CFD is computational fluodynamics. And it gives you, at every point of the surface, it gives you a pressure value. This, that's what the colors at the bottom are. And from this, you can infer drag and downforce and all the quantities you might need. So you do that for a certain number of samples. And then you compute what's called a response surface, meaning that you have all your simulations, which are represented here, by the, the red boxes. To each simulation is attached a value, which might be the drag. And you do nonlinear interpolation of that surface, which means you can then look for a potential minimum without re-simulating, just by doing optimization on that surface. So that is known as Krieging. It works very well for models that have only a small number of parameters. Problem is, uh, for those of you who've played with Gaussian processes, is when you go to uh, dimensions that are too high, you run into what's known as the curse of dimensionality, which means in a high dimensional space, everything is far from everything and uh, Gaussian processes don't work so well anymore. So what to do about this? And that's uh, where we come in. Well, we love uh, deep nets, right? And deep nets, what is a, a network? Really, it's a nonlinear interpolator. That's really at, at their heart, that's what deep networks are. So why not use a CNN or more specifically a GCNN? The G is for geodesic CNN that you run on the vertices of the mesh to do the interpolation, which is exactly what we've been doing. And uh, the, the big advantage of this is we can now deal with models that have lots and lots of parameters. We are not limited anymore 
as we were when we were using Gaussian processes. So here's the GCNN we're using. So it takes as input a mesh. Essentially, it's a ResNet. Uh, it's a ResNet, and except it does not operate on an image, it operates on a 3D mesh. And its output might be something like a pressure value at every vertex and maybe a drag value. And that's a standard trick in deep nets. If you make them multitask, they tend to generalize better. So here's an example of what a trained GCNN can do. You give it, uh, this is half of an Airbus, or I mean, I'd be delighted if it were half of a Boeing, given where you are, but it's pretty much the same as far as the network's concerned. Um, you can run a full simulation that will give you these values. These, uh, again, the colors are pressure values. And the curve here are the, the pressure value seen uh, if you look at the, the wing from the side. Or you can run our GCNN and it will give you values that are extremely close except one takes one hour and the other takes 30 millisecond. Essentially it's real time. And that's even true in more complicated regimes here. What we are playing at is we have a wing and we are changing the angle of attack and the speed. And we are in a transonic regime where things are harder than in a subsonic. And yet we do, the GCNN seem to be able to learn things well. And that comes back to what Ping was saying earlier about simulation. Simulation is fiendish because in this sort of regimes, you have turbulence. The kind of turbulence model you use is very important. And to a large extent, it's a black art to, do, to be done well. Anyway, we can use this to compute the, say the drag of a car given a 3D mesh representing it. And what's very good about this is now the drag, which I'm going to call D, is again, a differentiable function of the 3D vertices because it's computed using a deep net. So that makes us happy because why? Because now we have a fully differentiable pipeline. We start with a code C. C gives us a shape like one of these cars. And then we feed that into D, which gives us a drag. So now the drag, so the thing we want to minimize is a differentiable function of the parameters of the car of C which means we can optimize with respect to C to minimize drag. So here's a toy example where we have a rigid sphere and we are creating a shape around that sphere. So the sphere is incomprehensible, incompressible. And we create a sphere around it whose drag is supposed to be minimal. And we get this funny shape with a long tail, which actually is not unlike the shape of, if you think of uh, bike racers, speed bike racers, they have helmets that are very elongated at the back for exactly the same reason. You have something that has to go over uh, the head, which is more or less spherical and reduce drag. So this is actually a fairly reasonable shape. Here's something a bit more realistic. This is a drone that's built by a small company in our neighborhood. And um, it's, uh, so it's, a, it's an aircraft, it's not a quadcopter. And if you look at the wing profile, it's very, very simple. They didn't spend too much time uh, worrying about it. And yet it flies quite well because it has a fairly powerful electric engine. It turns out that with a good enough engine, you can fly, you can get almost anything to fly. 
but you use a lot of electricity. So that impacts your range. And so there is interest in improving the aerodynamics, which is something we've done, which is you can start with the original drone, the way you can buy it. And the measure of performance is called the L over D, lift to drag ratio. And then you can, for example, reshape the wings. So the, the system reshapes the wing. It already gives you a substantial improvement. And while you're at it, you can deform the whole thing. So deform not only the wings, but also the fuselage to get a lifting body. And the last and most difficult problem to solve is to convince management to actually build it. Now that's the hard part. Uh, cool, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, uh, this is really cool. Uh, but uh, so these optimization, uh, you explain the whole pipeline where everything's differentiable. Uh, right. But so these designs, the design parameters are constrained, right? So how do you apply the constraints here? It's, uh, well, we do gradient descent. So it's uh, projected gradient. Okay, gotcha. Cool. So you, you basically project back to uh, yeah. constraints. Okay. And you could do you could do anything if you have, if you if there is a technique you like better, you can use it, right? We, we simply use the simplest one. Okay. In this case. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, maybe and now this. Another, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe ask another question. So uh, look like in the pipeline view methods, the material property does not matter much, whether it's elastic or plastic, right? Okay. We don't have it, which is not a good thing. Uh, that would be, I mean, there's a, you, you can, right now we are only optimizing for L over D, but in the real engineering application, we would optimize for L over D, for structural integrity, for uh, weight, uh, all of this would matter. And yeah. what, what we'd be looking for is a Pareto optimum. Okay. Because it's a multi-objective thing. And uh, uh, essentially, that's what we're doing research on these days. This is far from solved. Yeah. And also, uh, I guess at this stage, you wouldn't, uh, you were not considered like fractures, right? The only. Uh, no, no. Uh, not in this. Well, we hope it's fractured. We're in trouble. So we want okay. to build in enough structural rigidity so that it doesn't happen. Okay. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, here's. Oh, yeah. Yes. So uh, we know that networks are good at interpolation. Uh, so I'm trying to understand. Uh, so is it useful for uh, to, uh, extrapolation or what? It, it's really inter it's, it's really in it's really interpolation. I think because okay. we have a training set. Okay, so uh, if you have many training data. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, I get it. So, yeah. Well, the, the problem is, okay, so C, we are, the, the latent vector is of dimension 256 typically for these things. We cannot have training data that covers all that space densely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's why we need a deep net to uh, uh, to fill in the blanks. Got it. Thanks. I think there's a recent paper discussing, you know, in, for deep learning, everything is actually extrapolation because dimension is so high. So, like, oh, even if true. it's 266 dimensions, you're still pretty much doing extrapolation. So, okay. yeah, that, that that would be actually okay. So this is now much more theory, but this is a problem I haven't discussed, but which is a very real one, which is when can you believe the predictions of the network? It seems to work within a range, but what that range is, I could not tell you. But actually I'd be interested, can you send me the link to the paper you just mentioned? Oh yeah, sure, I'll, I'll find it and try to send in the chat, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, after all these two examples, let me show you a real one, which is, uh, well, it may not look like it, but this is a bicycle, or at least the aero shell of a bicycle. 
maybe you can see it a little bit better when uh, uh, when it's finished. So this is fresh out of the mold, and this is the same uh, painted. And you can see there are wheels here, two wheels, the two bikers. And when they bike, uh, their head is here, their feet are here, and the seat is here. And what the game is, is there is this race every year, well, every year without COVID, uh, in uh, Nevada, where you have a five mile long road, which is straight and flat. So you start on this, you pedal as hard as you can, and uh, the game is, and you are get, you clocked on the very final stretch. And the, the game is to, of course, go as fast as possible. And with this thing, that's how we helped them design it by these kind of minimizations. They actually, so in 2019, they broke, they broke a couple of world records, uh, which uh, I mean, is if you look at these speeds, that's pretty fast on the bike, on the flat road. Um, and of course, I mean, uh, many things have to go right for this sort of thing to happen, but having low drag and good aerodynamics was an important part of it. But uh, maybe to come back to uh, Ping's question is, this is a bit simplistic in a sense that we only did the aerodynamics. We didn't worry about uh, how strong it was going to be, for example which in a, say if it were a car, we'd have to worry about that, which is why there's still a lot of work to be done in years to come. So uh, speaking of cars, and maybe that gives you an idea, I think, um, I don't know if I, I didn't see the name, but the, uh, uh, the gentleman with black uh, glasses on his uh, photo picture, who asked, how do I guarantee that, um, that I get uh, the, the right kind of shape is I can train my uh, decoder to produce things that look like cars. So I can, in fact, given shape nets, I can use an auto decoding approach to learn at the same time the code vector and the weights of the network so that I can approximate all the cars in ShapeNet. So that's really how I guarantee that for any, C, any reasonable C I put in my uh, network, I'll get a, a reasonable car. And now that I have that same idea, I plug in uh, my uh, GCNN that computes drag. And now I have a differentiable pipeline that goes from a code to, uh, to a drag. And I can minimize D of C and uh, somebody mentioned constraints. Well, under constraint, of course, typically, for example, just to make it simple, you should leave some space for the passengers and the engine. So here's an example where you start with an SUV and you optimize it under those constraints and you get this. Or, and that's something we've worked on, we can do a bit like before, we can sketch something on the tablet. It will produce the car that looks like it. And at the same time has good aerodynamic performance. So the idea eventually is we want to do a tool for designers who are not engineers, but who know how to sketch. So this is uh, essentially version 1.0 of this. And now we are working on version 2.0 where if you are going to do something like a car, well, cars and any other sophisticated um, object are made of parts. So for example, you have the car body and the wheels. And it's a lot better if the wheels do not touch the car body, it'll roll better. So we've actually expanded this approach to use not only one SDF, but several 
that can describe different kinds of primitives. We have, for example, cylindrical primitives and freeform primitives to model the wheels and the body of the car. And you, we can optimize all this simultaneously and produce results where the wheels actually do not touch the, the, the car, which is more realistic than when you see in a lot of the, the currently published papers. And so to do this, we've essentially expanded on the previous architecture so that you start with a latent code that will produce several primitives as several in one. There's one branch would produce a generic SDF like the ones I've shown. And the other branches will produce the, the other primitives like the wheels. Or like in the case of this is object here is known as a water mixer. The idea is you have some liquid that comes at one end that's made of, I don't know, uh, two different fluids. It's being mixed in the thing. And when it comes out, the two fluids are well mixed. And this part is made of an elix in the center, which is encased in a cylinder. And it has uh, things at the top to, uh, to close it. And for it to work well, you have to have the elix that just touches the walls of the cylinder, but of course, doesn't go beyond. So again, you need constraints. And we have this representation that uh, lets us do this. So for example, here on this video, I'm changing uh, the tube and the elix uh, adapts automatically. Or here, I'm changing the helix, but its radius remain constant and it still touches the tube. And we can do the same kind of thing, say on the, on the car. So we, we start from the car at the top and we change the wheels. We put new wheels on it and the system changes the body so that the wheels uh, so that the wheel wells essentially now have the right size and position for the new wheels. And where I'd like to go from this, this is still very preliminary, but what I would like to go with this is to produce models that the resulting model is something you could actually build directly. You optimize it and you build it with as little manual intervention as you can. And this is also applicable. I mean, I've talked a lot about uh, design and all sorts of things, but I'm still uh, a vision guy. And we do in the lab, we do a lot of uh, biomedical imaging. Uh, so for example, this idea I've just presented could be applied to modding the heart because a human heart, I mean, a heart in general uh, is made of four chambers that have to have the right shape. And at the same time that connect to each other correctly so that the, the blood flows. So a lot of the ideas I've presented would also apply in that, uh, in that area. And that's something we are going to be working on as well. So in conclusion, what I've shown in this talk that we have a formalism that allows us to get the best of both worlds in terms of implicit and explicit representations while preserving end-to-end -end differentiability. Uh, we use deep sign functions. So to implement 3D meshes that can uh, change a topology. And I think that opens the door to all sorts of interesting applications. So I've talked a lot about CFD. I've mentioned uh, medical imaging, but I'm sure there are quite a few others. And I don't know if you're interested in something we could discuss at a later date. And of course, I have to thank a lot of people for doing all this work, which are mostly a lot of students or former students and postdocs in the lab. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Pascal. This is a wonderful talk. And it's also you made 